or an open org, and we want to be permissionless in, in the way that we can. So the question we're really asking ourselves is not just how can we share those assets, but how can I share them permissionlessly? Like how can I share them without the need to talk to anyone? Yeah, right. ever. Like I shouldn't. It should just be an error. No. I can come and click and play. And I want to do that for zero cost to the user. Yeah, where we just share in the return, so they don't actually put any capital up front. In our model, we share in the income. Right. So, so, so the solution became. So the solution that we came up with in the end was after I was working on a loyalty product for a group that was in Pleasadale that I haven't ultimately ever released. But the mechanic behind it was about rewarding loyalty, and what I was actually building was a risk modeling framework for assessing that loyalty outside with certain data points. And what we were able to do is use that same kind of model of a risk matrix on user statistics and playing data to basically assess players on their probability to earn. to Mission G5 with Brad Nickel, where we explore projects in decentralized finance that are innovating and driving our mission of financial freedom forward. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review Mission G5 and spread the word by posting a tweet to the show. All opinions expressed by Brad Nickel or his guests are their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Black Knox, Material Indicators, or any other affiliated organizations. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Brad Nickel or his guests as an inducement to make a particular investment, follow a particular strategy, or become involved with any project. A project being featured on the show is not an endorsement of that project in any way. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Now, here's Mission DeFi with Brad Nickel. I am excited today to have on the show DeFi Ted from Paragon's DAO, and he's the project lead for the project. And we actually connected on Twitter. Who was it that, do you remember Ted who, who tweeted that here's the five projects that are really building and kicking ass? I don't remember who it was, but, and yours, I knew all, I knew four out of the five, but I didn't know yours. And so you told me it was time to get educated. So I am here ready to be the grasshopper, to be the student. I'm ready to learn, man. So I'm excited to kind of hear about what you guys are up to. Tweeted it as somebody I had some respect for. I wouldn't have responded that way. So I'm excited to learn what you're doing. So if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit of your background, kind of what you're all about, how you got here, how you got into crypto, and then we'll climb into what Paragons is all about. Does that sound good? That sounds great, Brad. So Jai Bhavani was the uh... Ah, that's right. Yeah. That, that, that tweeted. So I'd done a fair bit of stuff with Jai in their early Rari days. Um, nice. Helping out where I could with some advices and leads into like who I am. So you, so I have had an extensive background in DeFi. I've been around crypto since 2017. I was full-time into crypto in 2020 and I came to crypto from a traditional finance background, but not from where the most people come from when they speak of traditional finance. They're more talking like investment banking or some sort of trading desk or hedge high frequency trading. Or they, that, that's where they come from. That, that when they come yeah, from that or poker. Uh, yeah, that or poker. Yeah, exactly. Some sort of professional gambling, right? Um, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. Whereas I came from a risk background that heavily focused on consumer finance. So I used to uh, deal at the coal pace for the 12 years running risk strategies and frameworks for assessing consumers for credit cards, personal loans, and, and asset loans, home loans, and auto finance, and everything in between. So um, risk assessment kind of like underwriting or risk assessment yeah. from a corporate perspective? No, from an underwriting point of view. So, so I used to be a manual underwriter when I first started, so assessing a deal per deal basis. But then the way that technology went, it ended up becoming a very automated process, yeah, leaning on the tools that we had. So it was then about writing risk frameworks for data to be processed through to make that decision rather than being a person, right? So the whole kind of DeFi landscape really resonated with me because I'd just gone through a process of taking a very manual process of writing a loan and manually assessing it here in Australia with a large group, GE Capital, and 
turning that into a, a fully automated system where a consumer could come to a front end and receive a fully approved loan within three months. That makes total um, sense. Love that. Love that. Yeah. So, so during the, so I fell in love with crypto because I saw the benefit of more of the values, which were like decentralization, the ability to own your own assets. So that self-sovereignty 2016, it happened with the parity hack and the DAO, the original formation of the DAO and the DAO term was still very new and these ICOs were happening in 2017 and communities were kind of feel funny how they work with each other, but there right. wasn't like it was in DeFi when 2020 came along and we had governance tokens. It was, it was, yeah. Not even it close. Was slightly different. Yeah. And the thing that really attracted me to it was the idea that you could be judged on merit and having come from a very corporate background where they sell you the idea that merit will be taken into account, but it's never really driven that way when you're trying yeah. to climb a corporate ladder. It's not about what you know, it's who you know and what they can do for you for the most times. Yeah. And while that's still true in a lot of areas within the crypto organizational structure, even today, there are still pockets of groups that stick to that ethos. And finance is probably a great example that you can think of in regards to work that way, where they're trying to reward merit and they're trying to find ways to reward people without having to know them specifically. Well, I actually, I actually would argue that there's a significant amount of meritocracy here relative to the real world. It's dramatically larger. And I actually think meritocracy is one of our superpowers. This idea that not necessarily your title, your role, your college degree, whatever, is as critical as what you can produce, what you do, and how you contribute. So I love that something that attracted you as well. Well, if uh, well, actually, what's the date today? Like the 12th, 13th of, uh, or sorry, 14th, 13th of January, depending where you are. Yep. Uh, I mean, two years ago, I still got a pin post on my Twitter that speaks exactly today that crypto is the greatest meritocracy to ever be conceived. Nice, uh, nice. And I in a thread in regards to how you can participate if you're not a coder. I think that was one thing that was missing. And I wrote that two years ago. Nice. Um, so it's something I've kept in there and it's something that, yeah. And it's and like we just mentioned, it's a big reason that I came over. Love it. And then following through with that, that merit that I should have received in my old job was taken away during COVID when the government here in Australia allowed our businesses to basically remove, like, like basically just not pay their staff for a period of time. But right. I couldn't go any, I couldn't go anywhere as another employee. Right. You were stuck. You were locked right. in and oh. you weren't getting paid. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, but it was me that was affected and no one above me, right? Very That's cut brutal. off at a certain, certain area. Yeah. And you still had all your bills coming in and stuff and you work for a group and help them basically grow <laughs> to receive the profits where they could pay those people and they weren't filtering it down. The merit stopped. And I made a pretty easy decision. I said, yeah, I'll still be employed with you, but I dedicated no time. So I put all that time into working out how I was going to transfer my skills into this world. And it took a couple of months and uh, part of my language, but then I told him to fuck off. Nice. Very nice. Uh, I love it. I love it. And you don't have to ever worry about language on this show. So yeah, my first foray into this group, into this kind of working was with our group called Cover. If anyone remembers the insurance protocol from back in DeFi summer. And then the same group built out a, a protocol called Ruler, which was a non credible yeah, sure. loan platform. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so for a number of reasons, we didn't continue with that. <laughs> was your role jiving in here kind of, how have you kind of played a role in these projects? I'm assuming from the kind of background you gave us that you weren't a developer, but maybe you were. So what have you taken on as your role? I assume kind of with the underwriting experience, kind of assessing risk, maybe tokenomics, that kind of thing, but I should just let you tell me. Yeah. So I've got a really strong risk background in regards to my experience in not only writing it, but then in following through and in allowing that to have data feedback to us to get things right and really learn how kind of risk and incentive play a part with each other. So where I fell into the role was with as an advisor to those guys and we to, to setting up both incentive models for the token structures, as well as playing, helping them with the users and what incentivize those users to participate in parts of the protocol. Nice. 
Rightly or wrongly, I didn't have a lot listened in there, but but that was my responsibility anyway in cool. regards to why I was there. Now, the protocols didn't succeed, and that's going to happen for 99% of the ones that are going to be listening to this today as well. Yep. Sorry to be very, sorry to be very bad news. Well, look, I, I mean, would, this is an experiment, right? Everything we're doing is, and it doesn't evolve or get better without failure and success. So that that's part of what I expect every day. Correct. So the thing that was important to me at, at the point when the developers didn't want to continue was to just make sure that the holders that held the token got access to what was sitting in the treasury without yes. having any of the any of the core team involved in that kind of snapshot. So the you know we tried to make it work when they when the developers left. That was clearly evident. It wasn't going to. There were certain people that wanted to turn it into a basically a Ponzi. I wasn't <laughs> for that. And, and it turned out to be that only four months or five months after we shut that down, what that person turned out to be was Sifu, who turned out to be Michael Retreat. So it'd be a good decision on my part <laughs> to, to really fight, to kind of just shut it down. Um, That's a good move, man. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it took us a while, but I was able to re retrieve the funds and send them all out. And that was done the right way. That's but awesome. in the meantime, I'd been investing in a side game called Parallel. Sure. And during the tumultuous end of that protocol was the start of the DAO um, uh -huh. that we're talking about today. Um, and DAO. so, exactly, yeah. So silver linings, when one door shuts, another door opens. Uh, and uh, there was a lot, like, uh, I mean, even today, uh, if you don't know what Parallel is, we'll that in a second. But the people that were in the know on it and wanted to be involved in it were all very keen to kind of get around what we were doing at the DAO in regards to trying to share assets and create a community around it. But as we'll talk about soon, it's become so much more than that original vision or just like a community with cards. <laughs> and uh, they were, everyone was, I guess, rightly or wrongly allowed me to be the project lead and put a little bit of my vision and my learnings from the previous in, into practice. That's great. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of those learnings have been applied and we've definitely shown that we can, that we are definitely on the right track towards something that's much more successful than my, my, my last previous two stints in, in the crypto space. So Paragons, you're basically saying Paragons came about because of a community of people that were involved or engaged with that. And you guys are driving forward with the vision we're going to talk about in a minute. Again, I think that's a perfect example of learning from mistakes and failures, not necessarily yours, but learning from what happens in these worlds and building something else out of that from those lessons learned. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, getting given the opportunity to do this, I, I really wanted to give back and make sure that those that bestowed some sort of trust in me help trying to deliver this, were able to give them back the right product. It, it, more than what they could think of as well. So nice. it was, so I guess, I guess one of the best places to start is kind of what parallel is if people don't really know what the NFT game is. That's yeah, that's probably a good idea. So, so to give my best TLDR on it, it's a trading card game that is made with NFT, but it is both a web two and a web three game. I'll explain a little bit more on that. But the basis of the game is it's a Hearthstone, Magic the Gathering type strategy card game, right? Turn-based and you'll build a deck out of a supply of cards available to everyone and it's one-on-one. -on -one. So if you also played things like Gods Unchained and so forth, like it's going to have a similar type of like mechanic, right? In regards to the strategy. Got it. Yeah. Um, built on play to earn or play to win, really. So it's only when you win, do you receive returns? And then you can choose to be one of five different kind of factions or different parallels. So the law behind it is that the earth was basically destroyed by the people that lived on it because of our greenhouse gas ways and so forth. And, and humans kind of left the earth and went to different areas of the of space and now that the earth has kind of healed itself they want to reclaim it and the earth and still remain so there's this earthen group that have managed to live through the and come out the other end what happened with the earth and they live kind of with the earth now and they're the defenders so they're more of a defending kind of class you've got the Marcolians who went to mars and they're kind of like your war hungry guys they're bloodthirsty so they're very much for your attacking or highly um I think, to, uh, Anyone wants to be highly offensive in their, their strategy. You've got the Qatari who went to, they went to a moon Europa, if I remember correctly. And uh, they basically got the ability to transfer their learnings of the previous dean to the next dean. So it means that nice. when you're born, you're born with a lifetime of this kind of knowledge and understanding. 
So it's allowed wow, them to really pretty cool. to ex yeah to expand their technologically their technologically advanced. Yeah. Nice. You've got a group called the Organ Core who are tinkerers in the in the space and they kind of can build anything out of anything. Right. So they you can have their, their cards and strategies involved with them multiplying their assets multiple times and having this huge hoard that can seem like impossible to take down. And then there's the Shroud who went to the furthest reaches of the universe and have basically become nothing more than just the kind of the core elements of what the universe is. And they're at one with kind of the elements that make up the universe itself. So a lot of their stuff is very mystic and kind of like a magic or a wizard in a way, yeah. if you wanted to refer to a different one. So you, they really built it around the right playing card of games. And what I love the character. I love the uh, team makes up makeups that that's, uh, that's really cool. Sorry, go ahead. Well, they've thought really hard about what they want to do. Now, remember the, the, so these builders that are building this game are from the games that you love before, like Hearthstone and Magic. So they understand what gamers want, but the lore, I think, is what really gets me excited as well. Sure. Uh, they've brought in some heavy artists to, I mean, that's what got me drawn into the color cards in the first place. If you haven't seen them, I mean, hopefully you show one here, but they, they, the art is just second to none when it comes to a game in this space, yeah. trying to release a game. Um, I've definitely seen it and it's definitely beautiful. And then they've been able to build in this economic layer with some of these assets that really both add value back to the economy within the game, but also add value to those that want to participate as a capital investor. So it, it touches so many different parts, like DeFi participation, gamers with their participation. And then think about trading card games. They already have kind of this already feel where you get collectors involved. They already end up with a secondary market. I mean, even without NFTs, you've got like Pokemon cards, magic cards, all that. It just happens. That's the human nature of things. So by having that as a NFT on chain and removing a lot of the, the friction points around selling physicals, just even looking after them and keeping them in the right condition can cost money. Sure. Uh, so so it just adds another layer to it so so that's parallel it's a it's it, it, it can it will be completely free to play there will be a free version you just don't win any prime when we need the asset the, the play to earn to it you'll need the nfts for that okay um, very cool yeah so and that's why i'm probably even more bullish on it because it doesn't actually have a like a roadblock for those who want to just try and learn right right uh, makes sense so, Get people engaged, um, find out if they like it, find out if they like the backstory, the mechanics of, uh, of everything that's available. And then if you do, you make the investment because you want to do more. Exactly, 100%, right? So Great. in my first thesis on gaming and crypto with what was going to be successful was I likened the space to kind of online poker, but it reminded me I like a group of people trying to grind their way with the skill and having to put a bit of capital up front. It just reminded me of, yeah. and I thought a parallel touched on those things that were the most transferable in regards to that kind of example you've got the poker it's free to play anyone can play the rules are online anyone can read it you play at home with your friends with matchsticks yeah now right. if you win enough matchsticks you can start to do add money to the composition and that's where like it would be the same as buying an nft right put some capital like in right yeah what play to earn or play to win does with these mechanics in these spaces allows people with those skills to take the same route and grind their way to an income and actually have like maybe a part-time job that pays a return, right? In a professional setting, rather than it just be, I'm paying to play a game and hopefully one day I'll win a tournament. So, so it really, so that's how I saw it. And if we look back at what the online channel did to poker, exponentially proved it in that period. So I feel as though NFT games with the right modeling like that do the same thing. Yeah, makes total sense. Makes total sense. I love it. So, uh, all right. So you have parallel and then kind of what has been Paragon's role in, in that world and how did it form out of that? And tell me more about what's going on. What is Paragon as in, in relation to the game? Sure. So Paragon's DAO started as Parallel DAO originally. So we really did this total, total parallel and we had a number of unique assets, which are called masterpieces. They're one of ones. They earn 1% of the, of the, in the royalties. So they earn 20% of the, of the 5% royalty share that is from the secondary trading for each asset. So a masterpiece itself is just a one of one of a, of a playable card, right? 
and there right. might be a special edition of it, a first edition of it, and multiple supplies of it uh, in different types of versions of it. For every one of those versions that's sold, no matter what, 20% of the 5% fee will go to the masterpiece owner. Okay. Yeah. So, so as a group of DeFi guys, we kind of liked that. We're like, oh, this is interesting. This is a real return. Yeah, something um, to invest in. Yeah, yeah. So you've got the investable side of thing happening. That's not really like like a DAO, a community. That's just an investing group. That's just a Telegram with a bank account that's shared. Right. So <laughs> we wanted it to be more than that. So we came up with this idea of maybe we can use like the own style bonds, right, to suck in a bunch of assets as well when the time's right. Wow. And the idea was, well, we could just share them. Yeah. And then we can share the returns. What a business model. Hurrah. Let's all high five each other. We've solved it. You can't sense my sarcasm. It's because I'm leading to something. And so we, we all come up with this lovely idea and, and then I'm tasked to go and put that into practice. And then I looked at the models that were in existence or who were doing the same thing. So the question we asked ourselves was, if we had a bunch of assets, we want to share them, right? How are we going to do that? So I looked at a bunch of models and the model is still the same today, actually, until what we'll talk about shortly, is I can wallet connect myself to a gaming guild or whoever these people are sharing assets. I can see the returns I've been given and I can see the assets I'm renting. But to get to that stage, I've basically got to go through a manual credit assessment like I would have done before I got to crypto. Wow. You've got to go to the thing. You've got to sign up a Google sheet, give them a bunch of information, go to the discord. You'll generally get interviewed as well. And they'll want to know like your win loss ratios of certain games and so forth. And I'm thinking to myself, this is like giving like a customer going, oh, well, yeah, this is great. You want $10,000. So I'm just going to need your bank statement, your bank, your pay slips. That's what it felt like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, why the hell are we doing this? Like, like I already sold this in real credit. Why are we doing it just to let people use assets? So <laughs> um, th that was the first thing. Now at this stage, I didn't know how we we're gonna do it. So we launched in January last year with our initial bonding event. That's what we called it, the IBE. And that was coupled with a, like a liquidity bootstrapping pool. So we're able to basically acquire from the market 7,000 assets in that bonding event nice. in return for vested PDT back. So they had an ownership in the, still in the Dow. And everyone at that point said that we, that's it, we've done it. We've got the assets. We know what we're doing. We're sharing the assets and we're just going to do it better than those guys. We're not going to make them jump through hoops. Now, it, it would be a lie to say that within, in June, I had it all sold. I did not. And in fact, I was still where we were in, in kind of when we started, except for maybe a little less confident. So yeah. we started on the right things. We, so, so Paragon's DAO started out instead of going forth with just any random solution and trying to just put together what's already been done before and then fix it. We started out with governance and decentralization and made that okay. focus. So Paragon's DAO is now run and we've just had our third election for this, is now run on a council model for which is synthetics. So we have a Paragons Council that makes decisions on proposals that are proposed to the community or to alpha changes on direction and products and implementation. And then we have a Treasury Council that makes the monetary decisions on that. Nice. Um, and we elect into those roles. So what that's done is allow people to still have a governance say with their tokens while applying a, an element of speed on that decision-making process. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So let me make, let me quickly, before you continue on, make sure I'm on the right path here with you. So theoretically you wanted a way to have assets that you could provide to players for the game that would earn revenue for the members of the DAO itself. And you, as part of this process, wanted to figure out a way that, that you could have mechanisms for earning additionally for the DAO beyond that is the gist of what I get, but also you wanted a way to make this a less laborious and manual process to choose people that would be qualified to utilize the assets. And 
you started off with trying to make it as decentralized and governance oriented as possible. And you've got all of that in place at this time, right? How did you, are you still working through the concept of how we determine, am I on the right track? And do, so the governance side of stuff is in place now. So that's where we wanted to start. Right. Right. Just because it was something that we actually had a solution for. Right. There were models sure. out there that we could use that were running successfully. So we wanted to start with that. And again, it was just coming back to our values. We want to make sure that we stick to being decentralized or an open org and we want to be permissionless in, in the way that we can. So the question we were really asking ourselves is not just how can we share those assets, but how can I share them permissionlessly? Like how can I share them without the need to talk to anyone? Yeah. Right. Ever. Like I shouldn't. It should just be an error no. I can come and click and play. So yeah, and, and I want to do that. The case. Yeah, and I want to do that for zero cost to the user, yeah, where we just share in the return. So they don't actually put any capital up front. In our model, we share in the income. Right. So, so, so the solution became, so the solution that we came up with in the end was after I was working on a loyalty product for a group that was in PleaserDAO that I haven't ultimately ever released, but the mechanic behind it was about rewarding loyalty. And what I was actually building was a risk modeling framework for assessing that loyalty outside with certain data points. And what we were able to do is use that same kind of model or a risk matrix on user statistics and playing data to basically assess players on their probability to earn. Nice. And it ranks them as such. So that ranking score led into the ability to create kind of an earning concept where we could generate a PXV, like an XV value. And then we played on the premise of making those, all those tokens sell bound. So you can't actually sell them. So they're literally tied to nice. your account. Right. Um, and in, by, by moting the tokens within that environment, it turns it into just an internal credit system, like a checks and balances. Nice. So what we're then able to use is process the raw data on their outcomes within the use of assets within our system and then reward them as such with ongoing credits to continue to gain access right and allows them to continue to come back and earn come back and earn come back and earn without ever forking out a dollar nice what were the data points that you used for gaming skills and the other set of data points that allowed you to kind of get to that point of being able to create that system so well, you just need to think, well, first of all, it needs to be what's important to the DAO. Like, like, so it can't be just like anyone can come and play. So in parallel, the ultimate winning point is a win, like a win. You will only earn if you win. So that so that's going to be the one of the most crucial data points that is in there. So sure. we want to reward that higher. So all we did is went through and found, okay, well, we want people who can win. We want people who win often, more often than not, right? And then we can look down at things of like what your average time to a win is, what your average time to a loss is, and what your because a loss in some instances is not a loss where you played. A loss can be a forfeit because you are beat. So right. okay. sometimes it's good to look for people who are able to basically know when to fold, right? And just move right. on. Yeah. Nice. So so yeah, yeah. so so there's the, a the few other things in there. I won't give that away too much at the moment, but sure. it basically weights that across a scoring system. And then applies that. And then we multiply that score by the win ratio, by the wins to give them a, like a final figure. Very cool. I want to quickly, I just, it kind of dawned on me that maybe some folks listening may not be familiar with how these games kind of work. And we've touched on it, but I just want to quickly summarize for people in the concept of guilds, et cetera. So in the play to earn space, play to win space in this case for the games, oftentimes because you've got to have NFTs to play, and win, be able to actually win in this game in parallel, getting those requires you to spend money and getting the best NFTs, the cards that will empower you to be stronger within the game requires more money because it's kind of a marketplace model and something that's going to help you win more and do better in a game is actually going to cost you more money because at the end of the day, you're going to be winning value back from the game. And so what's come out of the play to earn space are these guilds that will sponsor players and work with them and help them do better or whatever. But the idea is that you've got this collection, Paragons now has this collection from the initial event that you did of 7,000 cards or assets that can be utilized in the game and give players an edge. And so you're basically sponsoring players and then you're splitting the revenue that comes from the wins. And so what you were trying to do was determine 
hey, how do we find the players that are going to be the best players that will be the best investments? And it's almost like picking a professional football player for your team. What are they best at? How well do they do? Do they recognize when they're weak? Do they get out when they could? Are they strong enough to win? Are they smart enough to win? And how often do they win so that you guys know that you're utilizing these assets with people who are going to win more often than lose and who are, and you're optimizing the people you pick to win, but you wanted to automate it. You wanted to create a system, a permissionless system that didn't require them to pay you anything to, for the privilege, but at the same time would make sure that the DAO was investing the assets the best they could in the best players. Yeah, that's a great summary. Cool. Cool. Just wanted to make sure everybody understood that because we've done this long description. I just wanted to summarize it real quick. So cool. All right. Yeah, so for lack of better words, we wanted to turn the management side of things where someone actually needs to manage it into a fully passive process. Love it. So that we don't need to manage it. All we need to manage is the data. Yeah, and yep. the data will yep. tell us what we then need to change within our own system, but where we can change in the risk modeling to smooth out some imperfections over time. And that's all that needs to happen. Sure. And we can add new games to that. So we can add more than just parallels. So they'll be frontier and arvo and so forth so as you participate in all the other games that that experience point amalgamates together to be used within our, our ecosystem that's very uh, and, cool. and then that xp that that token that you earn that kind of solve that token is not only is it better for credit but it will be earned for other things as well you'll be able to rank up your id which is just the solve nft and that'll come with new benefits you'll be able to get a better rank of return the higher rank you go You'll be able to get access to different quality of assets. You'll be able to get access to direct access to certain tournament events that have larger prize pool. And then at some point, we haven't decided what rank it'll be at, but that will become transferable. It'll actually open up the ability for you to sell it. So it wow, forces nice. the user to actually put time and effort into an account before they can get that value back. That's awesome. That's really cool. I love those that incentive structure. And we play with that incentive along the whole way. We'll kind of see is that we want people to put in time and effort, especially when the cost of entry is zero, right? Right. right. So, so, so it's literally earning it. And I, oh, I would, I'm very interested to see what the secondary market looks like when it's a little bit more mature, because I don't think it'll be a frivolous if people are just selling, selling, and flipping when they've already put, say, a year's worth of time and effort into it, compared sure. to. I only paid a grand for it now it's worth two. Yeah, no, absolutely. And how much of this infrastructure is in place for you guys now? Do you have all of this going so and you're, we've got, you're just massaging it? So test nets for the player experience points and the ID are out. Our rental contracts are, are being deployed for tests very shortly. So that's how we control the cost of credit per day per asset, which is worked on via a utilization ratio. So if you think of like something like Aave, yeah, where you just have right. a utilization rate based on how much of the pool and it will work up that rate for the rate of return or the rate of cost of credit. We do the same thing, it, except there's no depositor in that in that version. Yeah, there is only a, it's only us on that, that as that counterparty in this environment. So what we're really looking for is how much it costs to borrow. Okay. So what we do is we take the average amount of credit or the magic, average amount of PXP earned for the day over the number of earners and then each asset has its own utilization schedule that's applied to. So depending on how much each asset is earned, it's how much interest it will charge based on that amount. And that's the and that's the cost of credit. That's for, cool. For yeah. This sounds like it might have been something that started off as a fairly simple concept and became complex very quickly, at least to build. <laughs> It, well, yeah, it definitely did. There's a lot of moving parts to what we've done. And we've got a couple of other rental contracts as well. The people would have seen the standards for 4907 and 5006, which are wrappers designed by Double Protocol to share NFTs, remove, kind of separates owner and user rights in a wrapper. So so we've got that, but that work, works more distinctly for direct rentals. So something like, like a one-of-one -one unique asset rather than it being in a pool of assets. So... Nice. So we'll still have that model. And I think the big thing that we're rolling out is that even though we're building this for Paragon's DAO, this whole product will have its own name and we're rolling it out as a permissionless factory for anyone to recreate. That's beautiful. Ecosystem. That's where I was just about to head with a question about, because the cool thing is the way that you've architected, this can be applied to 
other game systems across the board. So, so you're basically going to create a whole separate, there, there will be a platform, the platform will be utilized with Parallel, but it can now be utilized by others for other games and other systems. And does Paragons continue to run that and manage it and, and earn revenue from people utilizing it outside of Parallel? So we'll take a, we'll take a small fee for anyone that uses our deployer and our infrastructure somewhere in the lines of like half a percent or two, two point two five percent of their earnings, right? Through, through the system that they deploy. That'll be our return for the infrastructure. There's quite a lot of work that happens to get a game on board. Once a game is actually built in with our SDK, it makes it then permissionless for anyone else to do it. So we're working, we parallel will have that. We're working with Arvo and Frontier as well to have that in place. And we'll be putting out a call to arms over the next month in regards to other games that would like to, to have a look at that and investigate it and potentially integrate to allow their guilds to have this much easy, this very easy sharing model. And yeah, hopefully we can expand that ecosystem. That's, I think that's brilliant. I love the fact that this thing can expand that way that it's something that you can allow people to utilize and build with and earn revenue for the existing DAO, but also provide a real ecosystem around this thing. So, so the ecosystem's great, but it's only as good as if it's discoverable as well. So we like, we ultimately want a bunch of different other people doing what we've done. Go and invest in a game, invest in assets, create a passive yeah. way to share them with players, let them come with zero cost and just share in the income. And at least that way, when it's zero barrier to entry like that, the game will speak for themselves. And you got, there's no reason why they can't have players if it's free to play with this model. Yeah. So, so we're also building, we also acquired a group called the priming, which was a, which is a data and analytics tool for parallel. We're turning that into a, like a wallet aggregator, like a Zappify for gaming. So think of like a steam hub. Yeah. Huh, and, and we're going to provide an area where you can discover all the games that use our infrastructure. So as a user, oh, you'll just be able to come and play free games all day, every day. And there'll just be different ways to access it. That's fantastic. Wow, man. Did you guys perceive this path when you started? No, no, not at all. It, we, <laughs> th th this has all come from that first question. We want to share our assets and we don't want to do it that way. <laughs> I love the evolution of this. How, how long till you're able to start deploying for, for well, it sounds like you're still deploying your own test net now. How kind of what's your timeline for all the pieces here? So the timeline for our parallel access will not be until the public release of parallel. We'll have right. a testnet ongoing. So we'll have a, we'll have a, an initial profile of PDP, like your ID mint, um, right. sometime next month, actually, which will allow people to come And What the chaser to that will be is that we'll have a number of spots for the closed beta for parallel, which are ultimately highly wanted. Nice. We'll do a VRF, a chain link VRF raffle with the people that mint and allow them and we will basically bring those people into the closed beta and they will not only test parallel but also test our system at the same time so we will have th this test running side by side with our own individual PHP system what will actually be released first and likely that will be at the very start of q2 in april is the factory we'll likely go with the factory model before our own wow Okay. So, so the thing you didn't conceive of first is actually the thing that'll actually be out first because you're kind of waiting for the final release, the first release of the full blown parallel. Correct. So we read, we released what we want to for ourselves and the tools that we think that we need right? and added on some others. And a lot of those are in the final stages of development or are already in the test environment. And we're just scaling up ready for the closed beta testing with parallel. So we thought, well, if it's all going to be ready and testing, we're going to test that long. We might as well talk to some other games and try and bring them on and connect them in and, and allow other guilds to start to just tap into this, which allows us to also build our wallet application at the same time and ready for the parallel. It's a compelling offering for these other game environments, ecosystems, right? Because now, I mean, if you, if you think about the benefit to parallel of this, it is further engagement further involvement, further value for the cards. It just makes complete sense in terms of helping to feed the usage levels of the game because it empowers and enables people to play and ramp up more rapidly into a game. And that just increases, it, it increases all aspects of it, right? So from a biz dev perspective, your ability to go out and say, we've got this platform and this system, 
we want to attach to your game and allow people to do what we're doing for parallel over here. It, I think it's a pretty no brainer sales pitch. Yeah, I think so. The first thing is eliminating the cost to barrier of entry. Yeah. To a zero, to a big donut, right? Or at least like a very small gas cost, maybe somatic if you're on a side chain or something. But the next thing is going, well, how do I then reduce the barrier entry to understand Web3? So the thing that we're already thinking ahead of is how do we actually hide all the wires of what Web3 is about to really onboard the next one? Well, so you guys are, I mean, look, you started with this idea. Now you're becoming a, essentially a gaming infrastructure for Web3. You're taking this way beyond. It, well, it quickly, the model that we built for ourselves quickly, it, was, it became very apparent that it was highly scalable if we did it the right way. So we decided to run with that because we felt that our, even our own ecosystem actually only had more, actually only had the value it had if we allowed it to thrive everywhere else. Yeah. So, so, so that's the value that we ran with when we were building this out. And then it quickly became like, well, okay, well, we're going to need like a wallet. Like you're going to need to discover these. So how are we going to do that? And we spoke to the priming and in the end, we ended up just buying them and acquiring that and then taking on the responsibility to build that out ourselves with our own resource. So, and you can think about all the infrastructure we're building is actually, it forms into the very tip, which is that wallet of the iceberg, right? At the very top, right. it shows out of the ocean is the wallet. That's the aggregation. Sure. That's where 85% of the market will leave when they look at it. They're going to want to see everything they're doing. The thing that most people won't realize unless they spend enough time with us is that everything that comes underneath that, the infrastructure is also built by us. This is fucking brilliant, man. <laughs> just like I'm sitting here just going, holy shit. Well, now I understand the tweet. Because, I mean, look, the, this idea of being Steam for web, Game 5, for Web3 Gaming, this compelling narrative is incredible. Because, look, I'll, I could take my 16-year-old son. He would love Parallel, right? He'd be very excited about it and probably spend hours playing it. And the idea for him that he can earn from that, we all kind of understand that pitch of GameFi, you can earn from that. But mm. if he can find, if he can find that as he gets better at these games, that there is more for him to earn and more for him to level up and easier ways for him to do this, if he is engaged in your ecosystem, I mean, it's just, it's a lock, right? I mean, the incentive structure for the gamers is incredible. The incentive structure for the investors and the incentive structure for the games themselves, is, this all feeds itself beautifully. I really love where this is headed. Yeah. So like, like with Paragons, you'll have your own, like you'll have your own like kind of level and rank within Paragons and we're hoping that'll be the premier kind of like ticket with yeah. the assets that we hold. And it will likely take on more assets as it becomes apparent that they're the right ones to hold because that's what's getting used and so forth. But a user can have like as many of those that they want with other groups that want to invest and have their own membership model. Yeah. And yeah. I think there'll be like incentive games played with where the winner will be the gamer, right? They don't put in any money. Right. I think about the stupid games that we're playing with cool twos. Yeah. In, <laughs> yeah. in, in, in fucking DeFi summer. Right. Like, like, like they were just stupid games. Right. But you were, yep. it, you needed to still have capital to get the capital back. Whereas here yep. people can play games with like how much they're giving away. They can put sweeteners on top for a day. They can do whatever they want just to attract the attention of the free gamer to their, to, to their little ecosystem. The winner will wow. be the user. Yeah, I'm spinning here, man. This is this is really fantastic. Wow, wow. So I know Kane is an Australian from synthetics, and he calls himself the Godfather or the grandfather of yield farming. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to if we pull this <laughs> off. I'm gonna take that title straight <laughs> off. <laughs> I love it, man. I absolutely love it. Well, if Look, if you can deliver w w where you're taking this, th then I think you deserve it. And it's really amazing to me, and don't take offense at this, but this boring ass industry that you were in, <laughs> in, in TradFi, whatever you want to call it, doing, learning these risk assessment skills and this underwriting, that path for you through to here is just really amazing. It's, uh, I mean, if, if I could go back and tell you of 2016 or 2017, that this is where you were going to end up, you probably would have laughed at that point. Oh, my life is very, my life is very much fallen down that line before. I mean, to give you guys, <laughs> make your head spin a bit more. I'm a fully qualified butcher. What? Yeah. 
<laughs> so that's where I started by. I was cutting up meat in an abattoir. That's amazing, dude. So wow. I, got no, I got no university skills. I didn't finish secondary college. I was, you are the meritocracy. A, yeah, I, I, that's why I like what happens in a meritocracy. I really live and breathe it. I respect it. What a great story, man. So if today, okay, I, so I'm somebody that I'm a casual gamer. I'm never going to be a guy who you're signing up that's qualifying for your thing, right? But Oh, um, anyone I can start, sign up, sir. Okay. But I mean, so from an involvement perspective, are there still opportunities for investors on the backside of this right now? But how can people get involved and start participating and working within Paragon's DAO? Or is it the next phase of the factory? What's available to people to get involved as gamers, as whatever? So right now, I guess just being a PDT holder will, will get you some access over the next month and a half to some of the games that you've been waiting for. So there's that little breadcrumb. Right. As I mentioned, right. we'll be doing a minting event as well that will help raffle, up, raffle off some of those spots as well. But to be involved with Paragon Tower, I mean, we are a we run that way. So like, here, I'll give you an example. 85% of our workforce has been hired from the community. Nice. Not from going out and looking for someone, not from someone yeah. from the original founder. Actually, I'm the only one left from the original team that we're designing. Wow. Everyone wow. else has been hired from within. So That's great. And we've now got, we've now got 17 full-time. Um, wow. So it's a truly is that way. And that's all being organized and run by our council group. So, so that's how it's all come together. So if you want to participate, just jump into the discord. We're going to have lots of opportunity for people to see some really good alpha from us in the discord as we ask for PDT holders to help us do testing and so forth with our own sure. applications that I've been talking about. But even as a casual game, like as an investor, like if you own assets, one of the things that we're putting out will be sharing vaults. So you can think of it like yearn vaults, but for NFTs. Yeah. Huh. And yeah. you can come and deposit and just say you've got like this one asset. You'll actually be able to see how much it's utilized within whatever ecosystem you want to drop it into, what the average daily return of it is, a real yield. Yeah. And just drop nice. the asset in there. And away you go. We'll have that for our own ecosystem and we'll open that up for a factory for others to be able to access it as well. And as a casual gamer, I mean, our model allows when you create a new account, you get automatically two hours of credit. Yeah. Wow. So you get that to wow. start off with. Now our NFTs are soul bound and you can't transfer them to a certain rank. So, I mean, you can keep creating wallets and come back if you can't earn any TXP, but the most you're ever going to get is two hours. So it's not a big, big loss to us. Right. Yeah. But it allows casual gamers just to come along, sign up. Yeah, I got two hours. Let's trial it. And if you win a bit of TXP and you realize, oh, now I've got like a day's worth of credit. Oh, um, well, I might just play a little bit more. Yeah. This is really fantastic. And it's a fantastic story, man. I love how this thing has evolved and it's, I think you're, I think you got the tiger by the tail and you're, uh, you guys got a good thing rolling forward. And I love the vision. I love that it's, uh, that it's become so big. Uh, well, I mean, I like and hate it for two different reasons, but I like it as the investor, as the project leader, I hate it. Yeah, but look, yeah. as the thing is, we're, we're like the next six months is like really where the last kind of nearly what the years worth of work and everything that's been done by everyone will come to fruition. Yep. We basically got a deployment a month for six months and I'm very confident that our full ecosystem will be up at the time that Parallel launch their public, their public alpha release where nice. everyone can participate. So that is our goal date for our whole ecosystem to be up. Um, so people look forward to that. But sometime around April, we'll be looking to onboard other guilds without permissionless factory and start opening that as well. Well, look, it's interesting because that tweet was about building in this bear market and just continuing to crank away. Obviously, you guys are doing that. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see that if kind of the whole big gloom and doom, big recession coming, blah, blah, blah stuff actually happens what the actual impact is on game fire web3 gaming whatever you want to call it because i'm actually kind of of the mind that it may see that may be the one component of our world that actually has a boost out of something like that with if people are losing their jobs or people are unable to earn as much that this may be a place where a lot more time gets spent so i think it's gonna be really interesting over the next year to see what happens but 
certainly seems like when we come out of, of whatever's going to happen economically, that you guys are in a good position. What has it been like for you kind of learning to work with, find developers for the project uh, as the project lead? Well, finding developers, I guess we were lucky that we didn't have anything to really build from a solution point of view for the, through the first half of 2022. Because nice. I'm telling you around the other way, it was expensive. Yeah, uh, and it's not saying that coders aren't worth that, like what they get paid. I'm j- I just felt like it was overs compared to what I'd seen before. Of course, so absolutely. So we didn't start hiring until like August, September, and at that point there was a number of layoffs. So we've been able to get developers from like other gaming ecosystems and stuff that understood that, like, like at least the space. And then when we we're pitching to them over time, what we're doing, they just kind of got it. So. Hiring developers for me over the last bit has actually been really great. There's now quite a bit of talent out there that's looking for a, like a real home <laughs> right? after this last 12 months. But I didn't really have, like, I think one of the best things I had was a, like a group network that I built over my time in crypto that I keep in contact with that, that I then like know this, like know those areas better than I do. If I don't know something, I generally won't try and make myself the knower of it. I'll just know enough so that I can actually work with someone else who knows it inside and out, right? And I outsource right. that kind yep. of thing. So it sounds like my whole career. Yeah, I was going to say, I can do a whole podcast on outsourcing. I'm able to lean on and then the other help vet them. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of learnings, a lot of things, a lot of traps I didn't know when hiring this space. You know, the, 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 well, founders out there are project leads. Don't call me founder. Is it's hard to get good people in an unknown environment yeah. that you can trust. And it's hard to get your due diligence done. But what I will say is like, just continue to follow through with it. You'll then leave find a group of people that are really solid and know, en- know enough other people that if they don't know who that person is, then they're probably not worth knowing or they might not be on the right radar because there are just as many scammers in that part of the space as well, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything else we should know about Paragon's DAO before we wrap up? We're heavily underpriced. (laughs) (laughs) No, I That's beautiful. I may, I may have to find that out and check it out because I, I'm you got me pretty is, fired up. That is not financial advice. No, but what I will not. say, what I will say is that for the most part, our core tenant has been true around being an ecosystem partner and social partner for the gaming space and Web three. How that looks and how we are a partner and how we work, well, well, that's about to come into the light and hopefully, hopefully get some people excited about it and, and some other games come along for the ride because I think that this will be a, a fun ecosystem to play with once we can flesh it out. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm going to be taking a deeper dive. So I appreciate that. I asked two questions at the end of every show. The first is kind of founder oriented and you kind of touched on it actually a little bit on the developer side, but I always ask if there are lessons that you've gotten out of the process of this project that you would pass on to other people thinking about starting in DeFi, GameFi, whatever, <clears throat> that you think you've learned the hard way or you just got lucky that you could pass along. Yeah, I think outside of what I mentioned to you around like hiring and and being an outsource, I guess, things that you're not the expert at. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I would say outside of that is don't manage the project itself, manage the people properly. Yeah, that are with you. One common thing that's always left out when I see teams can't break down or whatever, or they, you look at it and it's kind of, there's not as much happening as we thought, like basically Peter, the head's not talking to the body type thing. They're not talking to each other. Right. It's because there's no people leadership going on. There's no one, there's no people leadership. What I generally try and do, what I, what I learned and what I put into practice during this part of during the second part of the bear market was I relinquished a lot of my control over the total project in regards to running all shows. And I started to that out. And instead of investing time going, what's happening and what's happening, I was investing my time into their development as a leader and making sure that they oh, were just well equipped to manage their team. And then what's happened since is, well, it's allowed us to scale the way that we have because we're now very much on track with a lot of the development and it allows a lot more automation within those areas. That's, better for it. 
I will tell you, those are lessons I have learned over my career of just focusing my time and investing and growing the people leads to a shit ton more getting done than micromanaging projects. So I really love that lesson. That's excellent. It, it does. What well, does two things. It allows you to not have to micromanage, it allows you to delegate and allow things to be more aut autonomous from that point of view. I mean, the word autonomous is in our org, so we should kind of right. that as best we can. Right. And, and the, like the second thing it does is it creates a culture, right? That's throughout yeah. the, the leadership group that are the leaders. And then that filters down to the people within. So as one leader disappears because they want to go and do something else, it doesn't mean you have to recreate that culture. The new person is feeding into a culture that's already there. That's great. Love it. Love it. That's great advice. That's perfect. So the second question I ask everybody is, Name for me a project or a person, it's usually a person, that you think is, yeah, inspirational, critical to the space, thought leader, whatever, someone or project that you have admiration for and that you think is really important for kind of moving all of us forward. That's actually, a, that's a really good question because a long time ago, I would have said, um, well, I won't say who that is because I don't want to then take it away. But they've you know, no longer qualified, I guess. <laughs> correct. Yeah, they don't qualify anymore for other reasons. The, you know what? The person I would say now would be someone like Taylor Monahan from MetaMask. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And the reason yeah. I say that is like, she doesn't follow me. We're not friends. Uh, yeah. Anything like that. In fact, I've probably been critical of something or person in the past, and I do, and I remember receiving an exquisitely laden Twitter. <laughs> I think back. anybody who has spoken to her at some point or another. But I'm the same as that, so I can resonate with with the character. But yeah. what I what I also appreciate is her integrity. Uh, yeah. To the space. Yeah. Um, she continues to put herself in the firing line for the right reasons, even if people don't agree. That's how beautiful. she does it. Yep. It doesn't, it do, it, it, the one thing that I tell people is like, you know why, if the end result, like if the end, the destination is the same place we're going, who gives a fuck how we got there? Yeah, that's good. That's awesome. Yeah, so the way she's doing doesn't mean you don't like it. That's fine. But she's fighting for the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I wish more people could have a similar level of integrity. Nobody has brought her up before, <laughs> but you're absolutely spot on. I can completely disagree with something that she's saying and i have never met her and engaged anything more than on twitter but i completely respect her ethos and her willingness to always stand up for what she thinks is the right thing to do and i never feel like she's she's doing it for the ego stroke i think there's a core core mission there and that's fantastic that's a great choice man yeah so that yeah there, there you go that's that, that's my choice that's awesome. Ted, this has been a fantastic conversation. I don't often get to get completely excited about a project, but I'm actually can really see where this can go. And I'm actually pretty excited about this. And this is not financial advice people, but I'm definitely going to dive deeper because I think you're on to something pretty huge. And I also think it's something that's going to be beautifully positioned for coming out of the bear market into a general acceptance for what's going to happen with gaming, that you guys could be a real big, massive player in the space. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate the kind words and appreciate you having me on. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.